good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Pratt. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programming here at the Erie Canal Museum. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, the impact of the Erie Canal was immense, socially, economically, and politically. And today, we'll hear about another New York State Canal that was built shortly after the Erie, uh, that I think offers a unique look uh, into those transformations wrought by the Erie Canal. This is our 10th lunchtime lecture of 2022, with this year's theme being infrastructure. Be sure if you're in person, or if you're online and have the ability to get here, check out our Infrastructure of Empire exhibit, uh, which is up till the end of the month. Um, and uh, that exhibit and this program are funded in part by Humanities New York with the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our next lunchtime lecture is November 17th uh, and will also be hybrid with both in-person and virtual options. Uh, that lecture will feature the Canal Society of New York's Craig Williams uh, and look at the fascinating story of David Vaughn, an Irish immigrant who became a noted canal engineer and map maker. I've seen this talk before and just not one you're gonna wanna miss. Um, so hopefully you'll all be back here in a month um, or here. Um, and uh, some other things happening at the museum this Saturday on October 22nd, uh, our popular beers, bikes and barges uh, series loses the bikes uh, and becomes beers, boots and barges. So that'll be a walking tour from here to talking cursive brewing uh, investigating the history of Syracuse along the canal uh, and its brewing history as well. Uh, and then big news coming up, uh, the Gingerbread Gallery begins next month. Um, it's gonna open November 18th, grand opening though, uh, November 25th, and that'll run till January 7th. Be sure to get a ticket, buy a membership. You can bring your whole family. Um, there we go. So there's my commercial. Um, so now we'll get started on the talk. Uh, so uh, I was asked to give a little bit more background on myself. Uh, I'm Derek Pratt. Uh, I am the museum, the director of education. Sorry, I just got a new title like last week, so I'm still learning it. Um, director of education and public programming here at the museum. I've worked here for two years. Prior to that, I worked at um, Chittenango Landing Canal Boat Museum right down the road uh, in my hometown of Chittenango. And uh, I studied uh, history education at SUNY Cortland uh, for my undergrad and museum studies at Syracuse University. Um, so that's me. Um, like Popeye the Sailor, I am what I am. Um, now we shall begin looking at um, the Genesee Valley Canal. All right. Darn. Well, that's not working. There we go. All right. And to uh, know about the Genesee Valley Canal, uh, we've got to go a ways back in um, history to understand the Genesee Valley itself. Here's a map of New York. Uh, like most parts of New York, uh, it, its geography has been carved out by uh, the last ice age and the glaciers that passed over um, upstate New York. Um, just miles high uh, at times. Um, and uh, those carve out a number of valleys and lakes, including this valley, uh, the Genesee Valley. Um, and an interesting thing to note, uh, the glaciers kind of got up to about here uh, and they're stopped by what's called the Allegheny Plateau. Um, and they deposited at the end of their slow march across uh, North America, what's called a glacial moraine, which is kind of a hill of all the settlement uh, the glaciers push in front of them, which is important to note because that moraine uh, is the uh, separation in the watersheds of the Genesee River, which flows north into Lake Ontario, then the St. Lawrence River, and then um, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Allegheny River, um, which is to the south. Anyone know where the Allegheny leads? Ohio. The Ohio River. Pittsburgh. Right, meets the Monongahela at Pittsburgh, becomes the Ohio River, and then from there, joins up with the Mississippi River. So uh, water that falls 
in this southern tier of New York is headed for the Gulf of Mexico, ultimately. Um, and uh, this is going to be kind of important in uh, our story going forward. Could you point out where the Allegheny Plateau is? Um, the Allegheny Plateau kind of goes just across southern New York. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm no geologist. I read a report on this, so I, I don't know fully. Uh, um, but yes, kind of. Right, yep. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not really a geologist or anything. This is just my basic understanding uh, of how the Genesee Valley was formed. It gets initially carved out by the glaciers. Um, anyway, um, as the glaciers recede, human beings uh, begin moving in to um, what is now upstate New York following uh, migrating herds really of uh, caribou and other kind of megafauna at the time. So mammoths, mastodons, that sort of thing, hunting them. And over the next several thousand years, uh, they developed their own unique societies. Uh, and here in upstate New York, uh, this is the traditional homeland of the Haudenosaunee uh, people. Um, the originally five nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy uh, in 1700, so they'll be joined by the Tuscarora as well. Uh, the Genesee Valley is um, where the Seneca Nation uh, lives. And this is uh, really important to our story for a number of reasons, because um, it's um, here in the Genesee Valley, um, to really understand where its settlement uh, by uh, Anglo-American settlers begins, we have to go back to the Revolutionary War. Um, the Sullivan-Clinton campaign at the end of um, the revolution in um, 1779, uh, ordered by George Washington, he sends uh, John Sullivan and James Clinton, the father of the Erie Canal's DeWitt Clinton, uh, to the Finger Lakes um, to essentially commit genocide on the Haudenosaunee. Uh, their orders are to uh, burn villages and crops and make sure um, no one can really survive the winter. Um, and 160,000 bushels of corn uh, are burnt, uh, as well as a number of, of orchards. And uh, this is the first time, really, American settlers set eyes on the Genesee Valley. In the Seneca language, uh, the word Genesee derives from uh, a Seneca word, meaning Pleasant Valley. And uh, these soldiers, who are for the first time entering the Genesee Valley, uh, agree with that. They All these crops that they're burning, they see that the Genesee Valley is a very fertile area uh, and um, kind of a great place to settle. That's why the, the Seneca have lived there for uh, centuries. Um, so uh, this leads after the revolution, a number of these former veterans of the Sullivan Clinton campaign move to the Valley. Uh, there's Ebenezer Allen, who in 1789 will build one of the first permanent um, white settlements, um, if you will, on the Genesee Valley. Um, he sets up a mill uh, overlooking the uh, high falls of the Genesee River in what is today Rochester. Um, Nathaniel Rochester himself moves into the valley uh, from Maryland in 1792. Uh, and there's a number of small settlements that start forming uh, in the Genesee, uh, taking advantage of this waterway's national, natural transportation. Uh, notably Geneseo and Williamsburg. Um, things really start to change. Even more settlement begins after the 1797 Treaty of Big Tree, which is signed in Geneseo. Uh, it's agreement between the US government, the Haudenosaunee and several um, land um, companies uh, to purchase most of what is today Western New York uh, and leaving behind uh, 10 designated uh, Seneca reservations, many of which are located along uh, the Genesee River. Uh, those will also become important in our story later on. Uh, so that's the Genesee River Valley uh, as we reach the turn of the 19th century. Uh, now to tell the rest of our story, uh, we first got to look at another important valley, this one, the Mohawk River Valley in Eastern New York, also formed by glaciers. Uh, as the glaciers receded, 
the St. Lawrence River, the natural outlet for uh, the Great Lakes today, uh, was still blocked by ice. So that water that was from the melting of the glaciers had to find a new way out. It did that by carving out the Mohawk River Valley and the Hudson River Valley. Um, and uh, as you can see, it goes between the Adirondack and Catskill Mountains, uh, producing the only point in the Appalachian mountain chain between Georgia and Maine under 500 feet in elevation. It became an incredibly important natural transportation route. Um, and recognizing the importance of this route, uh, the early settlers of the American Republic, uh, let me just, let me just make sure, I just wanted to make sure everyone can hear me online. Um, decide uh, that is an excellent place to build a canal through, um, a natural, well, a transportation route through. Uh, so uh, in 1817, after a lot of wrangling, uh, they begin the construction of the Erie Canal, uh, largely uh, by hand, though um, a number of other uh, technological innovations are made on the canal. And this is important because um, prior to uh, the canal's construction, there were no trained civil engineers here in America. Um, Thomas Jefferson, when initially kind of confronted with the idea of building uh, this canal across New York State, uh, laughed Joshua Foreman uh, out of the room, uh, saying such a plan couldn't be accomplished in a century. Um, and there's a number of reasons why he said that. Um, but they only it only took him eight years to dig this 363-mile-long waterway connecting Lake Erie to the Hudson River, uh, and therefore the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. And to do that, they overcame 571 feet of elevation. Uh, between Lake Erie and Albany, and they did that through the use of 83 locks. Um, the canal prism at the time, 40 feet wide and four feet deep. And overall, this whole system, this whole 360 mile long waterway, cost a little over seven million dollars to dig. Now, I talk about the Erie Canal because it is very closely linked with how the Genesee Valley Canal is going to progress. And I want you to keep these numbers in mind because this is a sensible canal. Um, you will soon see the numbers, or at least hear the numbers for the Genesee Valley Canal. They're going to be wildly different. Um, anyway, and like I said, a number of um, innovations uh, occur uh, along the canal. You've got the deep cut outside of Lockport. Um, and here we see the flight of five locks uh, at Lockport, overcoming the Niagara escarpment. Um, these are five locks, all in order, overcoming 70 feet in elevation change uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, you also see the building of aqueducts. And this is where the Genesee River, uh, final River Valley, really starts to enter our canal story and they start to mix. This is the Genesee aqueduct at uh, Rochester. Um, this aqueduct is 800 feet long. Um, so this one, this is the second uh, one, still exists today. Uh, it is Broad Street in Rochester. You can drive over it still. Um, but anyway, um, this is one of 17 aqueducts on the Erie Canal system meant to take uh, canals over uh, natural bodies of water. Um, and when the canal comes to Rochester, it transforms the city. So the benefit of a canal is it makes transportation much, much easier and much, much cheaper. Uh, it had previously taken about a month to go from Buffalo to New York City prior to the canal. Um, after the canal, it takes about a week, so even less time from Rochester. This is one of the advantages Rochester has going for it. The other one, um, economically speaking, going for Rochester are these. These are the high falls of the Genesee, which we've already kind of talked about. These are 96 foot tall waterfalls uh, right across uh, the river from uh, Genesee Brewing today, uh, if you're familiar with Rochester. Um, 
these, this is an era before, you know, steam power uh, and the like. The way you powered things was through water. And as you can see from this picture, there is a ton of power being generated by the Genesee at this point. So you've got this incredible confluence of cheap, easy transportation and water power. And thus, uh, Rochester becomes a major mill town. Uh, specifically, uh, it creates a number of mills to produce flour. Uh, here we see some early images of Rochester, including one of its first uh, mills. Uh, you can see in the picture, uh, you've got a canal boat that's able to pull up right next to this mill so you can put um, flour onto it that's been produced. Um, and uh, Rochester becomes the first boom town, not just on the canal, but the term boom town is actually coined for uh, Rochester uh, from what we understand. And uh, by 1834, uh, it's going to be producing 500,000 barrels of flour annually. It becomes known as the Flour City. That's F-L-O-U-R. Eventually, they're going to stop doing that. Now it has a W in there. It's, uh, <laughs> doesn't work as well, but uh, Rochester booms as a result. And their mills are constantly uh, hungry for more and more wheat that they can grind into flour. Uh, here we have another uh, map. Um, they also want new markets. So they have New York City. They have this idea, hey, you know, it's not that far away. Maybe we could hook up the Allegheny River and make New Orleans a market as well, uh, and the Ohio River. We see on this map here in the um, this corner here, um, that is the proposed location of what will be called the Ohio Basin. The dream is the canal right there will hook up to the Ohio River uh, via what their plan is, the Genesee Valley Canal. So here we go. I told you this is a talk about the Genesee Valley Canal, like Alice's restaurant here. Um, so uh, the Genesee Valley, along with Rochester and much of the rest of New York, is being transformed by um, the canal. People recognize this demand in Rochester for wheat. Uh, this is actually an image of the Mohawk River Valley, but it shows you a pretty good idea of what was happening in a lot of these uh, river valleys throughout New York. Uh, trees are being felled at an enormous rate. You can see uh, in this map kind of the stumps left behind and farms are springing up all around the canal and the river uh, to try to get these um, goods to market um, that there's now a demand for. Um, and this is happening, like I said, in um, the Genesee Valley. Um, the initial attempt, they're going to try to navigate the river. Um, in 1817, the boat, the skimmer, is launched. Um, it would have been very similar, we believe, to uh, the boat pictured here. Uh, this is also on the Mohawk River Valley. Um, it's their uh, Durham boats or bateaus that could carry about 20 barrels of wheat or flour at a time which is, you know, a lot, several tons of wheat, uh, but a canal boat can carry up to 50 tons at this era of the canal. Eventually they're gonna carry 250 tons of goods. So this is kind of small potatoes. Um, and uh, you can kind of see uh, operating a Durham boat takes a ton of work. You have to, uh, if you're going upriver, you have to push against the current um, the whole way. Uh, and the Genesee River, if you've ever seen it, it's kind of a relatively wild river. It's got a lot of um, obstructions throughout it. So it's pretty difficult kind of getting down the river uh, as well. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, using this kind of method, um, it, in the 20 miles between Rochester, because that's where pretty much everyone is shipping their stuff in the Genesee, Valley 2 is Rochester, uh, takes 20 miles from Rochester to Avon. I've learned, I gave this talk recently at Mount Morris and I butchered the name apparently. 
hopefully I got it right that time. Um, that took that voyage downstream was 12 to 14 hours long. So if you're shipping goods uh, to Rochester from only 20 miles away, it's at least a full day's journey uh, to go there and back. And obviously you're gonna wanna sleep. So it's probably several days just to pass between um, these 20 miles. Um, things start to change a little, 1824. Um, the Erie Canal is constructed on the lower Genesee River. Uh, that is a 77 foot long steamboat. And you can again see the importance of the Erie Canal to the Genesee Valley. Uh, and their goal with this steamboat is it's gonna carry more wheat to Rochester and the Erie Canal. But that has a lot of problems too. It's running into the same uh, issues that the, um, the Durham boats are with all the obstructions in the river. Uh, the Genesee also is kind of um, hard to control its water levels as well, which is another uh, major issue. Uh, and anyone know the other issue uh, off the Genesee above Rochester? So south of Rochester. There we go. Uh, yes, someone in the crowd said Letchworth. Um, yeah, in case you're unfamiliar, there are three gigantic waterfalls uh, just past Mount Morris on the canal. So um, these boats can really only ply the areas between Rochester and Mount Morris, um, about a 50 mile stretch. Um, so the idea begins uh, that they should build a canal. Uh, shortly after the Erie Canal is completed in 1827, James Geddes, um, who many of us on the canal know, if you're from Syracuse, you recognize the name uh, as well. Uh, he's one of the initial canal engineers. He does an informal survey of the valley and finds, yes, it does look like it is possible you could build a canal from Rochester to the Allegheny River. Uh, However, not much happens. People recognize this would be a tremendous amount of work and expense. Um, but people in the Genesee Valley and Rochester uh, in general keep lobbying for this new canal. They're seeing the economic success going on all along the canal corridor. They want a piece of that action. Um, and also interestingly, uh, the state gets a lot of petitions from merchants in New York City who want this canal built. Uh, they think, they claim at least in their petitions, it's going to be a major boon uh, for everyone in New York State, and it's going to make primarily flour even cheaper, um, which would be a big thing. So for the next decade, they push for that. And finally, in 1834, a survey is authorized, led by Frederick Mills. Um, and uh, on May 6, 1836, uh, after he comes back with a survey and report, uh, the state tells him to go, to, tells New York to go ahead with it and try uh, building this canal, which will start digging in 1837, originally with Elisha Johnson as its chief engineer. And uh, now we're gonna look a little at the plans because they are ambitious ones that Johnson draws up. Here is a side profile of the canal. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with canals, you might know the Erie's, this is radically different than what the Erie Canal side profile looks like. If you're a canal nerd like me, the second you see it, you're like, that's crazy. Why would you ever try to do that? So as you can see, um, starts here uh, in Rochester um, at the lower end, and it climbs 978 feet uh, up to um, Ishua Creek and Cuba today. Um, again, remember the Erie Canal only went 571 feet in elevation. Also, Rochester is not like Albany, which is two feet above sea level. Rochester, something more like three to 400 feet above sea level. So ultimately, this canal, the summit level, as we call it in the canal world, that's that highest point uh, on the canal, is going to be 1,488 feet above sea level. That is not the highest summit level in America. It's the highest ever made in the world 
as far as I know, ever, no one has ever tried to uh, get a canal that high up. And the issue with having such a high summit level canal is you have to get water into it. So you have to find a reliable source of water to go into that point, 1,000, nearly 1,500 feet above sea level. And the requisite water to do that is just really hard to find. And that's gonna be an important part of our story. Well, uh, but the other thing here, uh, you see um, it's going from Rochester down here up to Olean. Uh, that takes about 104 miles. Uh, there's also this branch canal that goes to Dansville. Um, so for 124.75 miles of canal, they need 112 locks. That's 1.1 lock per mile. Um, again, remember, the Erie Canal, 363 miles long, only took 83 locks. Uh, so they want more locks than the Erie had in a third the space. Um, so it's really ambitious, but uh, New York and the rest of America is undergoing what's called canal mania at the time. Everywhere sees the success of the Erie and wants their own canal. And because of the new techniques and uh, engineering innovations brought on by the Erie Canal, people are really ambitious with what they think is possible for canal building. And as we're gonna see, the Genesee does get built. It was possible uh, to build. Um, there's just gonna be some issues uh, in, in building it. Um, they also estimate, these are two other very important things to take note of, um, that it will take, it will cost $2 million to build and it will be complete 1842. Um, so only six years, $2 million compared to the Erie Canal, not that bad, right? Uh, that took eight years, cost seven, a little over $7 million. Um, and they started digging, like I said, 1837. And uh, they have some early progress. They do have some hiccups near today's University of Rochester. Uh, in fact, in 1838, oh, ironically, uh, my fiance who graduated from University of Rochester is calling me right now. Uh, <laughs> but anywho, she wasn't involved in the riot that happened there. Uh, that was instead the Irish canal laborers who were uh, uh, being poorly paid and treated um, out there. Um, in 1838, um, but the state militia is actually called in, kind of uh, force these workers uh, to get the job done. And when you have uh, armed men pointing guns at you, uh, your work progresses well. Uh, and by late 1840, um, the Genesee Valley Canal is complete all the way up to Mount Morris. So right under the Letchworth Falls. Uh, here we see um, the announcement of the grand celebration they're having to celebrate the first 50 miles of this canal being built. Remember, it's only 104 miles to get to Olean. They're almost halfway there, right? Sure, we'll go with that. Um, that's, that's what they think. Um, I have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, however, um, they also start digging that side canal up to Dansville, which gets completed by 1842. Interestingly, if you're in Dansville, they have an area called Battle Street. So originally uh, the Dansville offshoot was mainly built. Uh, it breaks off its shakers from uh, the usual route of the canal uh, to provide water um, from one of the Finger Lakes. I can't remember which one, I think it's Kinesis. Um, my apologies to any audience members from Dansville. Um, but anyway, uh, the main goal is to get water um, that can feed the canal. Remember, getting water for this canal is the difficult part for it, one of the most difficult parts. Um, and it was going to circumvent downtown Dansville. The people of Dansville really wanted this canal. Uh, so they built their own kind of branch of the canal into downtown. Uh, the state tried to stop them. Uh, they sent engineers. Uh, to kind of try to rough up the townspeople. Townspeople bring their own people and uh, they fight this sort of minor battle um, in which the state is defeated and then they, they join the two canals. And that's where Battle Street in uh, Dansville is today. Uh, so that's just a really interesting uh, story. 
uh, I like to think uh, of there. However, um, they've completed it up to Dansville by 1842. Sadly, for the Genesee Valley Canal, perhaps, um, in the 18, late 1830s, there was an economic crisis, um, and all of these states, including New York, had invested just tons of money into building new canals. Remember, this canal mania. Um, and they didn't have the money yet to pay off the loans they had taken out to build these canals. These largely English banks that had floated these loans, they start calling in their money. States aren't able to pay. A couple of states go bankrupt during this time period. And to prevent New York from having that happen, uh, Governor William Seward uh, will sign in 1842 uh, the, what's known as the Stop and Tax Law. Um, the name, pretty straightforward. You have to stop building canals and tax people until you have enough money to build uh, these canals. Uh, it really affects the Genesee Valley and the Black River Canal, which is headed up into the Adirondacks, and the enlargement of the Erie Canal. That's another thing that's going to be important in our story. The Erie Canal, so successful originally, the state almost doubles it in size to 70 feet wide and 7 feet deep. Uh, and it's while they're doing this, they run into this stop and tax law. So that's not fully complete yet either. Um, and as a result, um, these first 50 miles of the Tennessee Valley Canal are able to operate for a while, but not the whole thing. Uh, so we leave the Genesee Valley Canal suspended there for a little bit. Uh, to talk a little about uh, the other important thing at this section of the canal, which is Mount Morris. We saw earlier that aqueduct able to pass over the Genesee River uh, due to the strength of the current below the Letchworth Falls. Um, an aqueduct wasn't possible uh, at Mount Morris to cross um, the Genesee River. Uh, so instead, uh, this was constructed, it's kind of an informal ferry system. Uh, so they would have had a cable, kind of a winch that could pull your boat across the canal. A dam is built here at Mount Morris to make sure water levels stay at proper levels. Uh, but sometimes that winch isn't working from what we understood, stand, and uh, people would uh, pull their boats across the river. Uh, we have a really cool story, uh, I think, um, from the Muncie family. Uh, their daughter uh, became, uh, because remember, whole families are living on these canal boats. Uh, their daughter became an expert at pulling their boat across the Genesee uh, River, and she would eventually build her own boat and serve as a canal boat captain, which I think is a pretty uh, interesting story. Another interesting story around this time, as stop and tax is ending, uh, it appears, um, New York State hires this man to become an engineer. This is Ely S. Parker, um, born to a prominent family in the Seneca Nation. Um, he has a very interesting life and career. Uh, he graduates uh, with an engineering degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute out in Troy, a uh, school founded largely by Erie Canal engineers. Uh, and his first job is working uh, as an engineer, uh, an assistant engineer uh, on the Erie and Genesee Valley Canals out by Rochester. Um, he's eventually going to move on in his engineering career. Uh, eventually, he finds his way to Galena, Illinois. Uh, where he meets a young Ulysses S. Grant. They become fast friends. He serves on Grant's staff during the Civil War and writes uh, the surrender documents at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, then uh, during Grant's administration, he became the first uh, indigenous person to hold the title of commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So interesting connection to the Genesee Valley. And like I said, eventually they did um, stop, stop and tax, or I guess they had taxed enough to stop the stop part um, and start building again in 1847. But now they've reached the really, really difficult part of the Genesee Valley Canal to build. Like I said, we've been able to get up to Shakers here on the far side of the map. And they had to get now around the Genesee Valley Gorge, where Letchworth State Park is today. You can see each one of those nicks between Shakers 
I'm going to call it Shakers because I have no idea how to pronounce Sonia. Yeah. Yeah. Did I do it? Yeah. That's the first time I've actually uh, said a Genesee Valley name correctly. Uh, goes up to Nunde. I've learned that one. Um, um, yeah. And it takes 49 locks to surmount this relatively short amount of time to get up to the level of the rim of the Genesee Gorge. Uh, and we also see a small deep cut like the one they had in Lockport that is dug so they can again reach the level of the Genesee Gorge. Um, some people might ask, why didn't they stay on the other side of um, the valley? And um, that terrain just was not practicable um, for canal building. I'm a historian, not an engineer. So I always say that. So um, don't ask me. Um, though I have ridden my bike on that side of Letchworth, and it is tough going. But as you can see, this was also tough. Uh, they also, uh, especially prior to stop and tax, they have this idea. You'll see on the map, abandoned tunnel. Uh, here we can kind of zoom in a bit more. Uh, there are plans for a 1,098-foot-long tunnel that the canal will pass through to kind of get around uh, several of the more difficult parts of uh, the Genesee Gorge uh, to dig through. However, um, they find the soil and rock just is not good there, and it keeps collapsing on them. Plus, also, once stop and tax happens, New York State is saying, you need to cut your costs here. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why this is going to cost tons of money to actually successfully build this canal tunnel. Um, one theory is that they had, um, one historian called it tunnel envy. There are a few other canals that build these really impressive tunnels. New York didn't have any tunnels, so we wanted one. Uh, but beside the point, really, um, the tunnels abandoned. Instead, they decide to go around the rim of the gorge. And the towpath, I should note, is on the Genesee River side of the canal. So your mules pulling your boats would be, and your mule driver are directly next to the edge of, well, here's an image uh, of it. Um, you can see uh, the Genesee Valley Canal here. Uh, on the uh, eastern rim of the gorge. Um, so yes, from what we understand uh, from accounts from this canal, this was not an enjoyable section to uh, lead your mule down. Um, also in this area, there's a section you can still apparently see in Letchworth today called the slide area uh, made up of uh, loose soil. Uh, it regularly has landslides. They had to build across this. They quickly found you couldn't just dig normal canal prism there. Uh, instead, they had to build a two mile long, essentially wooden bridge um, across this area of the gorge, which would eventually be uh, the most costly part of the canal to maintain. And you've got these landslides coming. You're building out of wood. Wood has a tendency to rot, especially if you get it wet, which in case you didn't realize, canals are somewhat wet. Um, um, but anyway, uh, if we go back here, um, so it passes along and then goes, heads to Portageville, um, where they do build an actual uh, aqueduct across the Genesee River. I sadly don't have a good picture of it, um, but they're able to cross at Portageville. It's a very high aqueduct uh, as well. It has to account for the gorge. Um, so there's one image of it, Sir Pat getting past the gorge. Um, we're lucky to have these images. There are not a lot of pictures of the Genesee Valley Canal. Um, and most of them are here uh, along the river. There's another look at the canal, snaking its way along what is now Letchworth State Park. All right, so now they've hit, let's see, where's Portageville on this? Right about here. So they've, they've gotten one pretty difficult section out, though you still got to go all the way from Belfast up to Black Creek, which is challenging. 
Um, though they've learned building locks really isn't that that challenging, especially if you don't have Genesee Valley Gorge uh, to contest with. However, the big issue is now the summit level for engineers. Um, an even bigger issue. Uh, so they determine the way to um, to get water to the canal is to dam up uh, two creeks at the top of um, at the summit level. Uh, Ishua Creek. No one's stopping me, so I hopefully said that correct. Nice. All right. I've been to the Genesee Valley enough this year. I'm starting to pick it up, I guess. The other is uh, Oil Creek. Now, they have no problems with Ishua Creek, but they begin uh, building this dam uh, on Oil Creek in 1852. And um, the state is sued by the Seneca Nation. Remember, we had talked about um, the Treaty of Big Tree. Um, a lot of these other um, reservations uh, on the Genesee Valley uh, are slowly gobbled up by land speculators and uh, generally illegal treaties done by the state of New York, uh, but there's still a reservation at Oil Creek um, and the Seneca Nation sues. Um, however, um, they look back at the Treaty of Big Tree and cannot find evidence that the Oil Creek Reservation was included uh, in the initial agreement. Um, kind of take for granted now how easy information is to find and store. Um, wasn't really the case, uh, especially on the uh, American frontier, if you will, in the 1790s. Things got lost, misplaced, etc. And in 1858, this man testified um, in the, uh, I believe it was New York State Court of Appeals. Uh, this is Governor Blackstake, fascinating character in his own right. By the 1850s, he's well over 100 years old. Um, he had served in the Revolution at the Battle of Oriskany. Um, his uncle, Hanson Lake, had um, uh, he developed um, a new um, Haudenosaunee uh, religious kind of belief system as well. He was one of its early converts. And where that new religious system had happened had been uh, at the Oil Creek. Uh, reservation. So this is some of the holiest land uh, for the Seneca Nation, or certain members of it. And it is slated to be flooded by the creation of this Oil Creek Reservoir. So he testifies in court uh, that he was there at the Treaty of Big Tree, which is true. Um, all of his family members um, were kind of very high up in the Seneca Nation. Uh, and he also testified uh, that Joseph Ellicott, who you might be familiar with, he's a canal uh, commissioner uh, and head of the Holland Land Company had told him that the Oil Creek Reservation was part of the agreement. And he also had given Governor Blacksnake a map showing where each of the reservations were supposed to be and the Oil Creek Reservation was indeed on there. So he's able to produce this map. And uh, in 1861, the Seneca Nation won uh, in uh, the Court of Appeals. Sadly, however, as it's too often been the case in New York history, uh, New York State just ignored that and continued to build um, the Oil Creek um, Dam. And as a result, Cuba Lake was formed, uh, flooding 51 acres of Seneca Nation territory. Um, overall, it's a um, 390 million cubic, have the exact numbers, feet of water, 500 acres, and 51 of those are submerging Seneca Nation lands. Uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the Seneca Nation did put in a land claim uh, on some of these areas. Uh, from what I believe, they were successful, um, but don't quote me on that possibly. Um, Around the lake. The land is owned by the Indians, but the houses are owned by, by the citizens. Okay. All right. Run. That was what I thought uh, the agreement might have been. Someone in the crowd, for those of you on TV, uh, on computer, uh, mentioned um, that a lot of the land surrounding 
Uh, the lake is owned by the Seneca Nation and is now leased out uh, to, um, as you can see, it's kind of a resort-ish destiny to the land holders uh, in the area. Um, so money is now going back to the Seneca Nation. Um, but um, so that's the story of Cuba Lake. Uh, they will still have consistent problems feeding um, the Genesee Valley uh, with water, though. Um, Cuba, Cuba, like Cuba. like the country. Yeah. Yep. Cuba Lake. Um, but once they get past the summit level, it's all downhill from there uh, to Olean. Um, However, um, again, after stopping tax, they've been told like, hey, save some money wherever you can. Um, and uh, it's gonna take a couple extra locks to get from Low Olean down to the Allegheny River. And the state does not wanna pay for those. Instead, uh, they authorize digging the canal six more miles uh, to Millgrove on the Allegheny River, which is where it ultimately hooks up to the river in 1861. Uh, remember, it was supposed to be completed in 1842. Uh, also, always part of the scheme was that Pennsylvania is gonna get on board and they were gonna improve, improve the upper Allegheny River. So boats could easily travel between Olean and Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania has no interest in this and they do nothing. Um, so this kind of grand scheme uh, it's already starting to fall apart by 1861. Um, also in 1862, um, the enlargement of the Erie Canal is declared complete. So the Genesee Valley Canal is built to the dimensions of the original canal, 40 feet wide and four feet deep. While the enlargement is now 70 feet wide, seven feet deep, can carry boats five times as large. So, the Genesee Valley Canal is already kind of outmoded at that point. Its boats are too small really to compete uh, with uh, boats on the, on the Erie. Um, and uh, nonetheless, the um, Genesee Valley Canal persists into the 1870s um, before ultimately uh, the state again trying to cut costs um, mid 1870s, there's this whole investigation into how much the canals are costing New York State, canal corruption, et cetera. Uh, and in 1877, uh, the state declares that many of these side branch canals uh, will be closed, including the Genesee Valley. Um, because there's still a bunch of goods lined up on the edges of the canal, we need to be shipped to Rochester and farther afield. Um, state gives them another year of operation. And on September 30th, 1878, um, the last boat passes down the Genesee Valley Canal. A couple of years later, uh, the Genesee Valley Canal Railroad Corporation, I hate that name tremendously, um, purchases uh, the land um, that the canal was built on. Um, now that you've got this kind of channel made, perfect to lay down tracks in the middle of it, in large parts, for $11,400. Uh, and start building a railroad, which goes into service in 1883. Um, this is not the Genesee Valley uh, Canal Railroad, but this is the original trestle in Letchworth. Um, and um, anyway, um, the Genesee Valley Canal Railroad uh, operates uh, at least partially until 1971. Um, and we see, so what, what can we take away from the Genesee Valley Canal? I think there's a lot. A lot of times, kind of people's knee-jerk reaction when they learn about the Genesee Valley Canal is just like, oh, that was crazy. Let's move on. Wow, what were they even thinking then? But there's, there's a lot to be learned uh, from this canal. Uh, in its inception, we see both the changes being wrought by the Erie Canal creating Rochester into this boomtown, making this massive demand for things like wheat and lumber. Um, and the canal mania that sweeps across the country as uh, the rest of America wants in on, they think America, New York has found the secret sauce to economic success and they want to be part of that. Um, and demand canals. We also see the progress in engineering that's made as a result of the Erie Canal 
makes things like the Genesee Valley Canal even possible uh, for people to think about. Um, I like this map. Uh, this is actually by David Vaughn, subject of next month's uh, lunchtime lecture, uh, showing you can see these uh, different colored lines. Uh, this is all of the land where their trade is going, being funneled to Albany and New York City, uh, thanks to the canals. Um, but anyway, um, the Genesee Valley Canal itself, um, a lot of stuff moves down it. Um, 400,000 bushels uh, of wheat moved down it, just that section that had been completed between 1845 and 1855. That's accounting for one third of all the wheat that is ground in Rochester at the time. So it's contributing to the growth of Rochester and a lot of these uh, towns that now dot the Genesee uh, Valley, you know, uh, Nunday, Mount Morris, Avon. I'm just really showing off that I know how to pronounce these towns now. Um, uh, anyway, um, so that's moving down the canal. Um, 200 million board feet of lumber uh, move down the canal towards Rochester. Gypsum, dairy, late in the canal's career, a lot of crude oil will move down it from the Pennsylvania oil fields. Um, the peak year uh, for the canal is 1854 tonnage wise, 159,000 tons uh, of goods reach Rochester and 5,390 boats um, enter and leave the Ohio Basin uh, headed for the Genesee Valley Canal. So you can see it was, it was economically changing um, the valley. Uh, though we also, of course, see communities being destroyed by this canal too, like uh, the Cuba Lake Reservation, uh, those other reservations that have been um, kind of parceled out in the Treaty of Big Tree are also gobbled up uh, by settlers in New York State as the Genesee Valley um, moves on, um, uh, grows. Um, also, um, another part of the economic story. So overall, this canal cost $6.7 million uh, from the state of New York to construct, an additional $2.8 million to upkeep. In total tolls, uh, all of those goods I just discussed brought in $860,000. Uh, so uh, the state lost about $7 million uh, on this canal uh, overall. Um, so that's another way people often view the canal uh, as, as a failure. Um, we also saw in the story of the canal um, new opportunities being made uh, for people who often want it, like the, the daughter of um, the Muncies, who becomes a canal boat owner and captain um, after her time in the Genesee Valley. And Eli S. Parker, um, a Native American person who was able to find a good, solid job as well. Um, so uh, this is all to say um, the Genesee Valley Canal is a very complex story. Um, and I mean, I'm a historian. We're not here to exactly lay judgment on the past. So I can't say was the canal good or bad, a success or a failure. Um, it's, it's all a lot more complex than that, but it gives us an interesting view into this era in uh, American history, New York history, Genesee Valley history. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can learn from it and uh, find some, some interesting lessons out of it. So with that said, are there any questions? And if you're on Zoom, um, you can um, ask in the chat. Someone points out to me uh, in the chat as well that the high falls are no longer 96 feet tall um, due to various floodings. Um, they've dammed the river a bit. So it's now only 89 feet tall. But at the time, 96, I believe. Any questions in the audience? There's one question on Zoom. Uh, it says, what group of immigrants were responsible for building the Genesee Valley Canal? Um, it's a great book. Uh, if anyone's interested in learning who built uh, various canals, it's Common Labor by Peter Way. Uh, his, obviously, we don't have like great records on everybody who built canals. Um, 
but um, by the 1830s ish, uh, it had largely become Irish immigrants who are the bulk of the canal building workforce. Um, it had essentially perceptions of canal building. Uh, it became more and more of a low status, kind of marginalized job. And everyone said that's a job for the Irish to do by that point. Um, uh, Mary Ponian asks, where can we view this talk again? Um, everyone who has registered will be getting a link on YouTube. Uh, it'll also be public on the Erie Canal Museum's YouTube channel in about a month or so, I believe. Any other questions? Yes. Or the side of the canal line and so forth. <clears throat> and so they went to northern Italy and they recruited Italian uh, ah. stone cutters from the quarries of northern Italy. Okay. And consequently, Syracuse had a large Italian population decided to North Italy. So, yeah, yes. Um, so for those of you on Zoom, pointed out that um, with the need for skilled um, stone cutters, uh, northern Italian stone cutters were often uh, recruited and brought over here to work on the canals. Um, another excellent question on Zoom is why did New York invest in widening the Erie Canal, the Cayuga Seneca Canal, et cetera, but not the Genesee Canal? So um, for those of you who are familiar with New York State Canals, um, there are still four New York canals that are operated. Um, the Oswego, Champlain, Cayuga Seneca, and Erie. Uh, why were those saved? Well, uh, for one, they're a heck of a lot shorter uh, than the Erie. Um, and they were successful. Um, like we saw, New York State dumped a lot of money into the Genesee Valley Canal, and they never got that return on investment. A canal like the Oswego Canal, which was right across the street from here, that's almost that has almost as much traffic uh, at points as the Erie Canal. It's really successful because it hooks up to Lake Ontario. It's relatively short, um, and the, the, the tolls were coming in to kind of pay for these canals, at least somewhat, um, is my best answer to that. Um, I also love Erie Canal politics, the corruption around it. So I'm sure Oswego, like Geneva, probably had some really good influential congressmen or something. Um, anywho, uh, another question we have, is the story of the Black River Canal similar? Uh, it is uh, somewhat, but in other ways, it isn't. Uh, the Black River actually isn't fully shut down until the early 1900s. And that is because it has kind of the opposite problem of the Genesee River Canal. It has tons of water available. They've got all these Adirondack reservoirs that are built to feed it, and they can still feed the Erie Canal, which always has a problem of how much water it has. So. Um, Parts of the Black River remain open, like I said, into the early 1900s, largely uh, to provide water to the larger Erie Canal system. Okay, another question. What are some of the best remnants of the Genesee Valley Canal that can still be seen today? From what I understand, head to the Nunday area. Um, everyone I talk to about the canal says, you can see a lot of uh, lock remains there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what happened a lot um, to many structures on the Genesee Valley Canal, um, they cut costs. So a lot of later locks were built of wood. Those rotted away or were built of hybrid wood and stone. Uh, then when the railroad came through and the canal was abandoned in other sections, um, a lot of the stone from those structures are kind of cannibalized uh, by locals and the railroad to build new structures. Uh, but there are still a bunch of blocks out by Dunday. Any other questions? All right then. Well, thank you. You've been a great audience.